Here we are, chapter 10. You made it. The body of the speech. Let's dive right in. A lot of students and a lot of public speakers kind of make a mistake when they go to prepare their speeches. They spend a lot of time thinking about the introduction of the speech because, you know, we've talked about before that the introduction and conclusion are extremely important. In fact, that's the part that your listeners are going to remember the most. But how can you introduce something that hasn't been created yet? That's a pretty important question. Because the introduction comes first in speeches, a lot of students begin to think that they should prepare their introduction first. But a lot of speakers who've been doing this for a while find it way easier to prepare the body of their speech first and then go back and prepare the introduction. If you stop and think about it, it kind of makes sense. How can you introduce the body of your speech until you know it in its fullness, in its full nature, exactly how the way you want it to be? So I encourage you this, to prepare the body first, then prepare the introduction, and then prepare the conclusion. This is going to help your flow as you prepare to create your speech. So always remember this. This is the logical flow of how to create your body. Start with your specific purpose. Don't forget that. Uh, For instance, let's take a look at uh, kind of a pseudo speech that we could give. Uh, The specific purpose of our uh, pretend speech would be to inform my audience of the ways in which some fake pills are sold to the public. So you start with the specific purpose. That's what we want to do to our audience. We want to inform them about the way that fake pills are sold to the public. Then you need to come up with your central idea. It's the key concept that you want your listeners to understand. You want them to believe or you want them to simply remember. In this case, it's going to be this. Some dishonest pharmaceutical companies use tricks to make fake pills seem legitimate. So first you start with that that uh, specific purpose, and then you come into the central idea. After you get that kind of established, you need to go into your main points for the purpose of our speech. Our first point will be these companies concoct a drug name that sounds like a real drug. And then our second main point will be that they use fancy packaging and set high prices to give an aura of another expensive drug. So these are going to be our two points that we kind of roll with today. Now, once you get those points lined out, you go ahead and start choosing your support materials. These companies concoct a drug name that sounds just like a real drug. You're looking for statistics, for examples, for testimonies, for narratives. One of the support materials that you could use right here is an example. For instance, maybe you've watched TV late at night and you've seen a company come on TV promoting a drug, a weight loss drug called Leptoprin. That sounds like a prescription drug, doesn't it? Uh, But it's really just a fake diet pill. So there's an, an example that would support your first contention. Your second point about fancy packaging and high prices can uh, provide some support materials around this uh, to make it stand up, to give it some legs. And one of the things you can talk about is that same drug, Eleptoprin, that's priced at $153. Yeah, you heard me right, $153 for a month's supply. Uh, For some reason here in the United States, we kind of equate the amount of money that we spend on something to its quality. And so marketers understand that. If we set a high price, it gives that aura that it's a really awesome drug that's going to help us lose weight. It's going to help us lose that stubborn belly fat. And so marketers know that, so they set that high price. It's really just a fake diet pill, so don't buy into the hype. Uh, Let's take a look at it visually uh, for you visual learners out there. This is a a schematic overview of what it takes to create the body. So the oval at the top is going to represent our central idea, and it's going to be developed by two main points. In this case, we're just going to go with two. You can have more than that. We'll see in a moment. But we're going to represent these main points by the pink triangles. And the main points are supported by the ovals at the bottom, which represent all of our support materials. Things like examples, statistics, and your stories and narratives. So let's kind of go through this process with an example. Uh, you begin with the the central idea. Uh, you need to um, think about uh, a topic that you want your listeners to know. So we're going to be talking about uh, 
Well, let's talk about alligators today, okay? We're in Louisiana. We can understand this. So let's talk about alligators and the fact that we can be... uh, we can easily avoid being attacked by an alligator. That's our central idea. We can easily be uh, avoid being attacked by an alligator. And so we need to make our first point. And so that first point represented by the pink box, let me just go back here. Central idea is that we can easily be avoided being attacked by alligator. Our first main point is going to be that we need to stay away from the banks and rivers where alligators live. All right, that's a pretty pretty important main point. If you don't want to get eaten by an alligator, stay away from where they live. Our second main point would flow into uh, maybe um, never never try to give alligators food. All right. So now our first main point is uh, stay away from where they live. Our second main point, let's just roll with don't try to feed an alligator. And so let's come up with some supports to help this. First, uh, the first thing about Uh, Well, let's just look at the second main point about never feeding an alligator. One of the things you could do uh, would be to support it with a testimony from an expert. Uh, Go to the wildlife and fisheries people. That would be a good support and ask them, what, what should we do? What are the dangers in feeding alligators? In fact, you may be able to get a quote from a wildlife and fisheries agent about how it's not smart to feed any wildlife. Uh, you know that the campaigns about don't feed the bears and campgrounds and stuff like that. You've got all that kind of support about how bad it is to feed them. And, and for your first main point, maybe you could support it about uh, staying away from where alligators actually live. The tragedy that happened about a year ago with the young boy at Disney World who went too close to the water's, water's edge and was dragged into the water by an alligator and was killed. Uh, that could be a story you bring into this to support that first main contention. So you can see it's not hard. You have your central idea, your main points, and then just support them. So let's take a look at some guidelines on how to devise your main points. You need to limit your number of main points, okay? Don't try to cover too much in one speech. You should limit your main points to just two or three. Now, occasionally you can bump up to four, but I would definitely not go over that, okay? Especially with these time constraints that you have on the next two speeches, six to eight minutes for informative, seven to nine with your persuasive. Uh, You don't need to go beyond two or three. Just develop those points fully. That's where you fill your time. Don't feel you have to have a lot of points. Make the basics clear and support it with tons of evidence, and you will find that you can fill that time. Not only should we restrict, uh, uh, you know, our points, we should restrict each main point to a single idea. Uh, don't don't think that you have to, uh, you know, you've done all this cool research and you're like, I've got six or seven main points that I want to bring. See if you can't fit those main points as sub points under a main topic. For instance, um, you have three main points and that's your limit. But are the other ones you think are main points, are they really supports? Can they just support your three main contentions? And here's another thing you don't need to do. You don't need to cram two points into a single idea. For instance, if you've got six points you really want to make and you're thinking, well, my first contention should be A and B. I'm going to mash them together. No, one point is a single idea. So stay away from the temptation of I want to cram all this information Uh, Professor Emanuel says, I can only have three points. I'll just put both of these as point two. No, you can't do that. That's going to confuse your audience. So restrict each main point to a single idea. Another thing is don't announce your topic. Um, That's just not good form. And we are guilty of this. Today we're going to be talking about, no, don't say that. Just roll in with what you want to say. Look at the example on the screen. It says, I'll discuss tourists I'll discuss tourists in space no don't do that your audience is smart enough to understand what you're talking about without you actually having to say what you're talking about what's better is to say tourism in space will become frequent by the year 2020 huge difference there 
Don't announce what you're talking about. That is a temptation. We got spoiled to that back in junior high when we wrote English papers, and we thought we could get away with uh, statements in essays like, today I'll be talking about the price of tea in China, and we got away with that mess. That is not even a good way to write an essay. So don't stand up and tell your audience, today we'll be talking about, no, don't do that. Just start talking about what you want to talk about. Your audience is smart enough to figure it out. And you'll be using visual aids, so that's going to help you and your audience's comprehension as well. So let's go on to organizing your main points. There's tons of different ways you can organize your main points. The first one we want to talk about is a chronological pattern. And in this pattern, you're, you're arranging your main points in a time sequence. What occurs first, what occurs second, and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, if you're describing how to bake bread, okay, uh, you can explain the first step, then the second step, and so on. But if you're describing a person's life, you can talk about their childhood, you can talk about their teenage years, and then their adulthood. So that's very valid, a very valid way of organizing your main points for public speeches. Follow that chronological pattern. Um, it also works well for persuasive as well. Now, here's a pattern that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, this is something called the spatial pattern. Now, you want to know this specifically because you'll probably see that on a test coming up. Uh, in a spatial pattern, you're going to organize all the things you're talking about according to the way in which they relate to each other in physical space. Think about if you're going to describe the uh, Statue of Liberty. You start at the feet and you move up to the arms or the torso, and you go on to the top of the head. Uh, you're talking about the way things re relate in, in, in reference to direction, maybe even north to south, east to west. Or maybe you're talking about what it looks like on the inside and now what it looks like on the outside. Think about a giant cactus. You could describe it by progressing from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom. This is a very valid way to organize your main points. You just have to think about spatial and think about the word space. They kind of run, you know, they got the same sounds. And so the way it relates to itself in space or to other things in space is the way that you would organize spatially. Uh, another way to do a speech and to organize your main points is the cause and effect pattern. Um, if you're concerned about why something happened or why something is happening, a cause and effect relationship is a great way to organize your main points. Uh, for example, some, some people refuse to ride in elevators because they have this strong fear of closed spaces. My grandmother would refuse to ride an elevator um, because she was claustrophobic. And the claustrophobia is the cause of a person's refusal to ride in an elevator. Uh, but because they have claustrophobia, that's the cause. The effect is I won't ride in an elevator. Cause, claustrophobia, effect, won't ride in an elevator. But don't be uh, cemented into this format because you can flip it around. You can actually talk about the effect. There are millions of people who refuse to ride in elevators, and the cause of this is claustrophobia. See, you can flip it around. Totally still a valid way to organize your main points. We're going to move on to problem and solution. Uh, this is a pattern that you can take to organize your main points. This is really popular in persuasive speeches in particular. Uh, this is the problem solution pattern, and, and this is dividing a speech into two different sections. There's a problem, and here's its solution. Now, in a speech on air pollution, for instance, the first half of the speech could explain the problem that there are harmful emissions from coal-burning plants. And the second half of your speech could offer a solution that clean energy from wind turbines and hydroelectric power should be researched and, and put in place instead of burning so much coal. So problem-solution, very good. It works very well in persuasive speeches particularly. You've also got a topical pattern, and this is where you divide your central ideas basically just by common sense. You kind of lose, use your logic, and your common sense is your guide here, and you talk about uh, topics in different sections. If you're going to talk about kings and queens, you want to inform your audience about kings and queens, you can talk about the absolute power 
those kings and queens that have absolute power that rule with the iron fist. You can also talk about limited power kings and queens. They do have some, but they can be overruled. And then you can talk about the no real power, uh, the figurehead queens, almost like what we have in Britain. Now, here's an interesting freebie for you. If you do a little research on the uh, nation of Canada, Canada is actually ruled by a queen. Bet you didn't know that. Because we think of it just being a democracy like the United States, but the the truth is uh, they have a queen. Does anybody know who the queen of Canada is? Yeah, uh, I didn't think you did. Maybe you did. If you did, that's really cool. Email me. Let me know. Uh, the king, excuse me, the queen of Canada is actually the queen of Britain. Same one. She ha- she rules Britain and she rules Canada. I'm not quite for sure why. That must have something to do with British uh, influences and rule back in the history. It has to because there's no other reason for her to actually be the queen of Canada as well. But she has no power there. It's just totally a figurehead role. You know, they have their own uh, form of government government outside of her. But yeah, that's a free one for you. So next time you're playing Trivial Pursuit, you will have that answer if that question comes up. Here's a variation on a topical pattern. It's called a statements of reasons pattern. Uh, for instance, if you're giving a, uh, a talk on, uh, you know, uh, health care uh, and uh, someone talks about why you should use ice on sprained ankles, well, then you can say, well, here's the reasons for that, A, B, and C. Ice is great for sprained ankles. Here are the reasons, A, B, and C. And that's a another form of uh, organizing your main points. Now, here's something important we need to spend a couple of minutes on because on your rubrics, you will see that there is a section under one of the sub. It's a subsection under one of the sections about using transitions in your speech. In fact, I w- I'm going to be looking for these uh, in your last speech. Uh, you have to use them. It helps your audience flow with you and follow along with you as you speak. If you've ever driven over a bridge, especially that one in Baton Rouge, going into Baton Rouge, or maybe you're from down south, uh, central, uh, the Lake Charles Bridge, some of those bridges are pretty pretty crazy and pretty scary, especially that one in Lake Charles. Not only do you go up, you turn at the same time. That's a little disconcerting to me. Or the bridge over into Baton Rouge where if you're going into Baton Rouge and you're in the wrong lane and it's a lot of traffic, it's hard to get over into the lane that you want to get into. But bridges are designed to get you from one point to the next. You're you're getting over something, right? So you start on point A and you end on point B. The same concept applies to public speaking. You are coming from one point in your speech into another, and you need to give your audience a bridge to get from one point to the other. You need to let them know, hey, we're leaving this side of the river, and we're going to the other side of the river. In other words, when we get there, it's going to be a totally brand new point. Here's an example of a bridge statement that you can use. Now that we've examined the problem, let's turn our attention to the solution. You have signaled to the audience everything I've talked about has been the problem, but where we're headed right now at this exact moment, we're landing on the solution. This is a bridge. It lets your audience know we finished point A or part A. Now let's go to part B. So bridges are very uh, good uh, as a transition. You can use them in your speeches and I will be looking for them in especially the upcoming speeches that you have. Uh, An internal summary is another form of transition. You know that in your conclusion, you need to be summarizing your main points. So in your conclusions, summarize your main points. However, especially if you're giving like a process speech or something like that that has several steps in it, that if you come across the realization that you've got two or three steps that maybe have been a little bit in depth, you may need to stop and, and summarize in the middle of your speech. Uh, for instance, if you're 
giving a process, I don't know, about how to crochet a doily. I, I'm using that because I like the word doily. That kind of gives me a smile on my face. But if, you, if you're crocheting a doily and you've got four steps that you've already got, but you're not done, you're about to hit the most important step, go back and say, hey, just briefly review. Here's what you do. You buy the thread. You get the correct needles. You do this. And now you're ready for the most important step. I have internally summarized the first three steps of how to crochet a doily, it's important. It lets your audience stay with you and know that they are on the right track. And, and here's another different type of, of transition. We've got two more we're going to look at. Signposting is extremely important. Just like you're driving down the highway and you're looking at the signs, you know where you are on the road. You know where your exit is coming and how far away it is. Uh, these things need to be... Uh, metaphorically used in a public speech. In other words, you need to let your audience know where you are in the speech. Let's say you're giving a speech on how to treat a cold. Okay. And you could say, here are three things you should do the next time you catch a cold. You go one, two, three, and then you start building them in and extrapolating them in your speech. As you proceed through the speech, you could say, first, you should blah, blah, blah. Second, you should blah, blah, blah. And third, you should whatever you need to tell them about preventing colds. So you can see simply by saying first, second, and third, I've already told them here's three things you should do. The first is this, the second is this, and the third. Your audience knows where they are in the speech. And after the third, they know or should know that a summary is coming up and that a clincher is coming and that you're done. And so it keeps the audience on track to let you know where you are. So signpost, I'm looking for those. And the last thing is this. We talked about this before, but if you have an important step, especially in like a process speech or something like that, you've got an important step that you want your audience to know. Or in a persuasive speech where this is the kicker, this is the reason why you should change your thinking about this topic, you need to use a thing called a spotlight. And basically all this is, it's a it's a transitional device that, that lets your listeners know, kind of alerts them that something important is going to appear soon. Think about a stage in a theater. The spotlight comes on the actor walks into that spotlight and then the play begins or or he delivers a monologue or she has a facial expression that explains everything that's going on the same thing happens in public speaking uh, you know you turn that spotlight on by saying now we come to the most important thing that I have to tell you you can say that phrase that's a transition that's a spotlight don't forget this step if you're making bread, you have to use yeast, but not only yeast, this specific kind. You have just allowed your audience to follow with you and let them know, hey, this is a very, very important step. So transitions, you need to be using them. If you haven't done it already, start building them into the last few speeches that you have. They are important. And as you move forward in your public speaking career, remember, transitions keep your audience engaged. They keep to keep them knowing where they are and where and where they where the, the where the audience will know exactly where they are in the speech and and you won't surprise them with anything. So yeah, hopefully this helps you with uh, with coming up with the body of the speech and, and learning how to put in these transitions. We'll be looking for them from here on out.